So I'm Dan Gilman from ICLE, and I have the pleasure of moderating a really stellar panel today to talk uh, about the December 23 merger guidelines jointly issued by the FTC and the DOJ, <coughs> um, um, supplanting the 2020 vertical merger guidelines with F which FTC had withdrawn uh, after at least an hour's deliberation, uh, and um, uh, the 2010 horizontal merger guidelines. Uh, people know this. I'm not going to uh, give you a whole history. I, uh, before uh, introducing the panelists, I'd just like to um, thank a few people, all my colleagues at ICLE, but also uh, especially um, Charity Williamson in the back and Emily Holman who are making all this work and providing us with lunch. Maybe it's not free, but it's no charge. Um, and uh, Jennifer McLean, uh, our CEO back in, in uh, Portland, as well as um, ICLE scholars who've, who've sort of discussed all these things um, with me at length. Um, so uh, we have a ton of experience here from uh, uh, great people in the field. I'm not going to read their extensive bios at you because we have printed them and also put them on the website and it would take a long time and it would make me look bad. However, briefly, uh, Maureen Olhausen, now at Wilson Sonsini. Uh, people will probably remember that she was an FTC commissioner and acting chair uh, and um, one not famous piece of her history near and dear to my heart is that she hired me at the FTC when she ran the Office of Policy Planning. Um, <clears throat> Noah Phillips, a partner at Cravath and uh, also a former FTC commissioner. Um, Diana Moss, um, now at PPI and I think well known to many in the DC COMPA community uh, for her, for her, um, well, I mean, you know, for your policy work on uh, antitrust law and economics, uh, uh, both here at the American Antitrust Institute. Um, <coughs> Bruce Kobayashi, uh, a professor at George Mason Scalia Law and um, a former director of the FTC's uh, Bureau of Economics. And, uh, Kristen Lamarzi um, in private practice at Gibson Dunn, and also a former <laughs> agency person. And um, so I, I commend their bios to you, but we're just going to get started. <clears throat> because of the shape of the table, um, I'll ask questions. I'll try and shut up so that the authorities can speak. <clears throat> but all the questions are things to which several people might respond, so I'm just going to call on one person, but if you'd like to have some follow-up discussion on the point, and you're not the person I call on, just maybe tilt your name tent up, and that way I can look down and see and not miss, well, probably Bruce, Kristen, maybe. I mean, uh, um, alrighty, so <clears throat> on to the substance. Um, and uh, just starting with Marine, so <coughs> stepping back from the details of the guidelines, 50-page guidelines, um, uh, we see not just the predecessor documents, um, but this 40-year you know, history, 40-year-plus history of agency merger guidelines. And just in your own view, what do you see as the chief function or functions of merger guidelines? How have they been intended? How have they functioned? Great. Th thank you. Thanks, Dan, uh, for having me. I'm delighted to be here. A good decision I made many years ago was hiring, hiring Dan into OPP. Um, but the merger guidelines are, I think, a very can be a very useful tool. Right. So they are not, as we all know, they are not law. The FTC doesn't get to dictate what the law is. We have the Clayton Act. Uh, courts interpret it. The courts in the U.S. are the final arbiters of what the antitrust laws are. 
we have a different system for mergers than, say, uh, in, in other areas around the world, right? We have a pre-notification system under the HSR Act for mergers above a certain size. The agencies have a certain amount of time to review the, the merger. Um, they can ask for additional information. Um, and uh, then if the parties supply that information, the agency gets to make a decision whether to just let the merger go through or the parties uh, can just consummate. Uh, and uh, if the agency doesn't like it, they can file uh, a complaint to try to get an injunction to stop it. So it's not a pre-approval kind of system. You don't need permission to merge. You just need to give notice for mergers above a certain size. So the merger guidelines have been a very useful tool for explaining how the agencies are going to review a merger. What are the types of issues that they are concerned about? What have they learned over time about applying this test of what it means to substantially lessen competition in a relevant market? Uh, so we can see over time as the merger guidelines have evolved, the agencies have tried to articulate based on evolving case law and economic understanding, what tools, how are they going to look at these things? It's an extremely useful tool for practitioners to say, because often what you're doing in you know, a mer a counseling on a merger is to say, uh, is this merger uh, going to get, not just is it going to get challenged, but what might they look at? How long is it going to take? What are going to be the kinds of things that need to be you know, uh, sort of thought through really, really well. Um, and so having a guideline that explains the agency's thinking is useful. But one of the challenges that I think that happens is if the agency guidelines start to diverge from what the courts think that the law is. I'm sure that's a topic we will talk about, talk about today. But when the guidelines work well, they are a really good distillation of that learning through time, this you know iterative process in the um, uh, the, the system that we have in, in the U.S. Uh, to to articulate that, and then over time, if those are a good distillation, you see the courts kind of take them up too. They'll cite to the the agencies might cite to the guidelines in their complaint, um, and then the courts will uh, you know adopt that or talk about that. Um, but it's what the agencies say doesn't dictate what the courts do, it's really the other way around. So I mean, just to follow up on a point you made, and, and maybe I know we have several practitioners here, you can all, all talk with Chris, and just to jump in, you know, uh, you know, how useful and in what ways were the guidelines useful to you in counseling clients before? In my view, the, these guidelines are less about announcing something new from pre-December 2023 to you know, January 2024, right? These are descriptive of the agency's sort of focus and practice over the last couple of years. I think they confirm what we've already been seeing in speeches and, but also in second requests that we've been getting and in agency interactions and meetings and questions that you've been receiving from the agencies for the last couple of years. So I don't, I don't think it's sort of a, you know, a sea change and that's the way I try to describe it to clients. I do think in terms of the challenge with using them to counsel is that they're long on describing concerns, but slightly shorter on describing how you evaluate those concerns. So in the platform guideline, for example, the draft version of that I thought was really difficult and concerning and made a lot of categorical statements about the implications of acquisitions by platforms in terms of network effects and something called conflicts of interest. And taken together, it seemed to condemn sort of a wide swath of, of platform acquisitions. The agencies, I think on their listening tour and to their credit, did actually do a lot of listening. Um, they revised the language to soften it, which is great. But it still just now contains a lot of coulds and mays and not a lot of whys and hows. And I think that's what makes them very difficult to use. I think the other thing that I at least talk to my clients about with respect to the guidelines is while they are a statement of agency priorities and, and agency aspirations, it really remains to be seen how aggressively the agencies are actually moving in enforcement, right? And so, 
the guidelines articulate a number of new and novel approaches, but I think for the most part, the challenges that we've seen rest at least to a large extent on some pretty traditional theories. And the agencies have suffered some losses, but for the most part, those haven't been on the legal issues, they've been on, on the facts. Sure, I'll take a crack at that question. Um, and thanks for inviting me here today and with all these wonderful colleagues and thinkers and all of you, uh, always a pleasure. So is there a case to be made for an update? Um, I, I think the answer is generally yes. The 2010 guidelines were 13 years old. And you know, they were written by economists, so economists are terse, and you know we're not very um, effusive, or, or um, uh, you know we like to keep things short. Efficiency governs our profession, so um, I, I do think in a, a more expanded, descriptive, as Kristen was talking about, it's descriptive um, approach to how the agency set forth how they will go about investigating mergers was, was probably a bit of a welcome um, development. I, I will say this, I do not think that new guidelines should be prompted by the need to reinforce or punctuate um, a particular agency strategy or particular agency messaging. Um, I think guidelines should be of general applicability. They should reflect current developments and learning and legal, uh, legal precedent. But they should not be issued solely or primarily to punctuate a particular um, agenda or ideological agenda. And, and there are a few traces of that in the guidelines. A lot of focus on multi-sided markets and platforms. That is a, uh, obviously a, a, a very strong, intense focus of the Biden enforcers. Uh, uh, a focus on labor markets, um, a focus on serial acquisitions. All of these correspond to a case, right? We had the Penguin Simon Schuster case for labor. You know, we had the United Health change and all of the monopolization cases for multi-sided markets. Anesthesia partners for serial acquisitions, um, and then Meta within for potential competition. So. Um, I think a lot of this elucidation is welcome, but I would have liked to see um, a more generalized, impartial, neutral delivery of how to improve guidance, uh, agency um, guidance. And I do think there was also room to, to be more expansive on anything that would have supported the consumer welfare standard, right? And the application of effects-based analysis under the consumer welfare standard. Um, discussion of price effects, non-price effects, we see some of that in the new guidelines, but uh, it's important, especially in non-price, zero-price markets. Uh, uh, more on innovation, for example. I think it's pretty clear that uh, antitrust merger and merger enforcement can address harms in any any market in a supply chain, any set of trading partners, for example, whether it be the final consumer and a distributor, or an input supplier and an intermediate um, business that is is fashioning, say, intermediate products. So I think that's pretty clear, and that was welcome. Uh, discussion, but I, I also think that for the for the uh, the lay reader, um, uh, it's a lot of economics. It's it's a lot of discussion, a very detailed discussion of economic analysis and methods. Um, and obviously, the economic profession has come a long way in contributing to supporting antitrust enforcement. Um, but you know, the attempt there was to balance against more citation to more legal precedent. And um, you know, I think they struck that balance, but I am not totally convinced that um, we, we needed 50 pages of deep, deep, deep dives into the very, very specific details. And, and I always think of this from an administrability standpoint, right? I mean, judges are, they're not bound by the guidelines, but they consider the guidelines and they're gonna have to sort of uh, understand the guidelines. I have already talked to multiple district court judges about the guidelines and the confusion that the guidelines will create for them as they adjudicate cases. And these are smart judges. They're, 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 you know, some of them are antitrust practitioners in their previous lives and their future lives. So um, I, I do think it presents a bit of a mixed bag in terms of motivation. Um, uh, it does strive for some useful updates, but then there is sort of overreaching on, some co on, on, on depth and, um, and expanding on certain topics. So, um, Diana, I completely agree with, with what you're saying, and one of the things that I found really interesting is we're talking about an update, except that the guidelines go back to essentially brown shoe from 1962 as the source of all wisdom, 
uh, and they were saying, well, we're going back to the, like, rooted in the case law. And I mentioned the Hart Scott Rodino Act for a reason that was passed in 1976. That gave the agencies the ability to review mergers and to get an injunction before the merger was consummated. So most of merger case law since then has happened at the district and appellate court level, not going to the Supreme Court. But the, the guidelines are extremely light in citing any of that with the idea as if nobody else ever thought about brown shoe or these things. When you say, well, every court of appeals that was interpreting these things had brown shoe as the precedent, and this is how they've interpreted it. So the idea that you can just sort of wipe that away and just have some sort of like originalist reading of brown shoe <laughs> that controls, I just find a little, a little puzzling. Just briefly and first of all, thanks for having us. It's a real honor to be here with ICLE and to see so many familiar faces. I'm just gonna say my view, not necessarily the view of my clients or Cravath. Um, I do think there is a sort of funny tension as well. The guidelines are, the new guidelines are billed both as reflecting what we hear about new market realities, that we've taken a look, markets are developing in ways that we didn't anticipate, and also a reversion to case law from the 1960s. So it's plausible as a matter of logic that like, what was the case in the 1960s, which the courts were presumably accurately describing, also happens to reflect the market realities today. But the other plausible answer is that there is a little bit of tension here. Um, and I do think it's curious. It, it reminded me to some extent of, there's that scene in um, that, I think it's the first season of Mad Men, where they're trying to get around the problem of uh, the negative research coming out about cigarettes and Don Draper is like, well, they're toasted. And the executive is like, yeah, but they're all toasted. He's like, no, no, yours are toasted. There is a sense in which, like, we always look to the case law. That's not really a new feature. What I do think um, Maureen hits on, which is absolutely right, is that we do have a lot of case law development since. Right? We do have sources that judges, in their sort of daily evaluation of these deals, consult. Um, how that relates to the guidelines and how that's going to play out in court, to me, is sort of the most important question. I'd, I'd also like to thank you, ICLE for, for having me. Um, I, I just want to follow up. I, I was on a panel with Diana. I can't remember. Maybe it was on, at my house on my screen. But um, the, the guidelines, I, I think starting from seven, what, what we used to do with those is we did merger commentary. So, I mean, if you're going to describe cases and you're going to have more details and you're going to have a document which describes how you apply some of the, the analysis suggested in, in the economic-based guidelines, then you did merger commentary and you said, look, here's, here's the public information we got. Uh, that was true in the 2020 uh, vertical merger guidelines, which were also, also withdrawn by the FTC because they, they wanted to erase history. Um, the 2020 vertical merger guidelines weren't that old, so um, we, we don't have the same problem, but um, I, I don't, we'll probably talk about that um, um, later on, so I won't do it now. What I want to talk about is the, the process of doing public policy. Um, my colleague and, and dear friend Tim Muris was once chairman, and uh, he was there when they had lost, I think, DOJ and State of California in eight hospital cases in a row. And so what they did was they started the mer merger litigation task force. They did a lot of uh, retrospectives and they had an evidence-based uh, way of trying to diagnose what the problem was. And the problem was the use of the Elzinga-Hogarty test and the use of critical loss, it's drawing these huge geographic markets. And it, it you know, spawned uh, an era where they had a lot of empirical research on what happened uh, when you had all of these hospital mergers that were challenged and then uh, consummated, they showed that you know, the, there were 40% price increases. And it led to a whole series of uh, victories, that, uh, a winning streak that, that lasted longer than um, the, the losing streak. And I think it was finally broken in uh, you know, um, when I was bureau director, it, uh, <laughs> that Philly merger. Um, 
but it uh, wasn't my fault. Um, <laughs> so you say. So you say, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but um, it, 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 it to, and to contrast, if you look at the evidence that they rely on for a lot of the stuff that, you know, I mean, the, the, uh, the change in the um, structural presumption thresholds, uh, there's no evidence for that. If they point to any evidence, it's evidence uh, that really um, is of the type that um, serious people have, have uh, uh, really just um, destroyed. Um, their, their notion of growing concentration uh, if you, you know, Furman and Orzag, you know, what people noted quite soon, the, uh, Greg Orden and Luke Frobe, uh, is that, you know, commerce, broad sectors based on NEICS two-digit codes are not anything like antitrust markets. If you do it at the local level, you get no, no increase in concentration. If you, um, if you look at, uh, um, not NAICS sectors, but try and build up uh, more plausible product markets based on product codes, you, you also don't get uh, an increase in concentration. Um, if you look at markups, and um, people look at the Lockyer and they said, oh, we've had this concentration, which at the, probably not true. We've also had this increase in markups. You know, my, m one of my uh, professors at UCLA, Harold Demsetz, uh, sort of destroyed the structure conduct performance regime by saying, look, there's two ways you get things like high profits or high markups. One is prices go up, one is costs go down, right? And Delacier did the same thing. They said, oh, look, over this, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 year time period when, uh, you know, um, the, the uh, Democrat and Republican uh, people running the agencies were, were acting lawlessly, uh, the markups have gone up. Well, you've had serious people like uh, Doppler et al., uh, Nate Miller, uh, Chris Conlon, who have a nice paper in the AER. Uh, you know, they said, well, well, what's the cause of the large markups? It turns out it's lowered cost, by and large, not higher prices. And so, uh, you know, really Harold Demsetz's critique is you know, one that should be taken into account uh, that, um, you know, firm growth, concentration, and high profits or markups could be signs of, you know, success, lowering costs. And, uh, you know, the, all the stuff, especially guideline one, but also the guideline eight on dominance uh, is, is a return back to, um, you know, a structural approach that, that really has no basis. A lot of interesting threads here, I mean, both on the economics and the law, and I, I mean, personal preference, I like it when they're usually <laughs> reinforcing and not too distant from each other. Um, one thing that you mentioned, Bruce, was sort of the, the economic underpinnings or lack thereof um, for the emphasis on uh, structural features of markets and mergers, basic HHIs, and so forth. Um, others mentioned sort of the case citations. I mean, one thing that jumped out at me in the section on uh, guideline one, where they introduced these new thresholds, and for the first time, as far as I could tell in 40 years, labeled the presumption a presumption of illegality. Um, the case citations seem weird to me. That struck a lot of us. The reversion to the old thresholds from yesteryear um, certainly has the effect, presumably positive from the perspective of the agencies, of saying, look, we view far more deals as presumptively illegal. And the suggestion had been that this was toughening up enforcement. Um, the prior guideline, like the threshold levels were set because of a study of prior enforcement. When had the agencies actually gone and intervened, right? And so presumably you would see some alignment then between the guidelines and what the courts were saying because the courts were dealing, Dan, right, with the numbers that the agencies were putting in front of them. Um, we, I don't know that we've seen yet enforcement at the margin, meaning where 
the old guidelines wouldn't have been met, but the new guidelines would. And we don't know how those cases will resolve. It does not take a lot to trip a Delta HHI of 100, right? You can have four other larger players in the market and five and six get together and there you are. Um, I think the, the agencies, though, still have resource constraints and they still may look more carefully just than at market concentration statistics in evaluating when to bring enforcement cases. And so I think I don't even know whether we're going to get over time, maybe we will, some guide as to what extent you know, that margin makes a difference. Because it does tell you they think a lot more deals are illegal, but getting to and we're going to challenge them is another question still. So I, I just wanted to chime in uh, to dovetail with w what we've heard so far. I, I think we can't sort of underappreciate or underestimate the degree to which neo and ideology really set the tone for, for the guidelines. And um, you know, it's most evident in, in the original draft version of the guidelines, uh, the 2023 guidelines, that really attempted bright line tests, right? And, and I, we, we raised this concern in our comments at PPI that these, I call them the should not guidelines. A merger should not do this, it should not do this. There was no reference, at least in the section, section two of the, of the draft guidelines that said, hey, you know, these are rebuttable, these are potentially rebuttable with economic evidence and analysis. Uh, we complained uh, uh, about that in our comments and lo and behold, in the final version, Every single guideline now contains a reference to um, um, rebuttal evidence. And that, so that was a really important improvement. But nonetheless, the draft guidelines started out with bright line tests, which is really at the core of neo-Brandeisian ideology. It's where, you know, the focus is on structural uh, measures of market competition, concentration levels, market shares. But you see that per permeating all aspects of the guidelines. So, um, you know, the threshold for highly concentrated markets is back down to 1800, right? But I, did anyone notice that all the other sub-thresholds are gone? So unconcentrated market, moderately concentrated market, they, th those were chopped off, chopped off, and left by the side of the road. That's actually works against the interests of promoting um, um, one of like what I call the frameworks, uh, I'm sorry, the applications guidelines, which is serial acquisitions. If the whole purpose of a serial acquisition is to is to sort of ride the thresholds or fly under the radar screen. And if you acquire enough small companies, then you will have expanded your footprint or market position significantly. It is those types of serial acquisitions that are less concentrative and will, if you stack them up, will lead to higher concentration over a period of time. But by excising the oh. thresholds on unconcentrated and moderately concentrated market, the agencies now have no benchmarks to evaluate serial acquisitions at lower levels of concentration. So I think that's actually a shooting yourself in the foot when it comes to, um, when it comes to trying to promote a certain ideological bent. And then the, the only other thing I would say on citations is we, we pointed out very strongly that the citations essentially excluded all examples of stronger enforcement under the Obama administration. Um, I'm coming out with a new study, should be out soon, on 30 years of empirical analysis of merger enforcement. Hands down, by far, the most vigorous administration on the merger front was Obama. It is not the Biden administration for a lot of really good empirically based reasons. But all of the case citations ignored the Obama administration. And again, this is part of neo-Brandeisian uh, messaging, is that we were the first enforcers to hit the earth that care about strong enforcement, forget about all, forget about Bill Baer, uh, you know, at the FTC and at DOJ. I, I mean, you know, to overlook this whole swath of, of uh, stronger enforcement uh, years and not include citations from those cases like Anthem Cigna, Cisco US Foods, those are important cases. We strongly suggested that those cases be included in the case citation and not rely entirely on case law from 100 years ago. Uh, that's, you know, there's been a lot of development. And I think for, for ideological accountability and honesty, regardless of the ideology of the administration, you have to be honest and acknowledge where, what the case law actually tells us. And so in the final version of the guidelines, we actually see more references to those Obama era cases. 
and I would view that as a very, um, as a very good um, development. But again, citing to a very selective group of cases was another way to sort of buttress or bolster a particular ideological approach. Minor disclaimer here. I'm thrilled with this panel. We did actually invite people from both <laughs> agencies to be <laughs> on the panel. Um, you know, I think this is a spectrum of views which maybe shows you something about how the guidelines have been received, but eh, I wanted to at least declare that we tried. Um, <laughs> so, uh, All right. Well, I feel pressure now to bring some balance. And I, <laughs> All right. Well, the, the two things I was going to say in response to Diana's points, which I think were helpful, I think there's a number of places in here where, and maybe this is not balanced, but it's at least, I think there is a concern that there are a number of ways in which these guidelines undermine aggressive antitrust enforcement in really important ways. And I think Diana had a good example of one. I think the, the discussion of actual potential competition and perceived potential competition is, a, is another area where the guideline seems to be sort of an admission against interest that you need a special doctrine or framework to get at acquisitions of nascent or potential competitors. I think Section 7's incipiency standard already gives the agencies everything that they need to do that. And in fact, the agencies, including the Obama administration, were successfully doing that and have been successfully doing that for decades. And so um, I think you know, you go in and say we need this special doctrine, which has almost never been successful, right? A, a successful challenge blocking a transaction on the actual potential or perceived potential competition. I think there's like one or two maybe in the wild in the last 40 years. And so uh, I'm not sure why you as an agency would want to set yourself up with that as opposed to come back to um, the sort of basic principles, which is another point that Diana made earlier that you know, the guidelines should be flexible enough and um, spring forth from some sort of bedrock principles enough to give the agencies that kind of flexibility um, in order to achieve their goals. And I, I think that comes back to the, the case citation point, which a number of people have pointed out sort of the selectivity of it. But I, I would like to challenge the idea that cases belong in guidelines uh, and at, at all. Um, I've seen a lot of people defend the new guidelines as having the advantage of citing case law and the, the, that this is a feature, not a bug. And the 2010 guidelines, by contrast, the horizontal ones, uh, you know, were sort of divorced from the case law. Um, I think it's a, it's a huge mistake to think that these prior versions of the guidelines were divorced. I wasn't at the agencies in 2020 for the vertical guidelines, but I was there in 2010 and worked on them. I was a, staff attorney in the appellate section, my job the very first out of the gate uh, on the project of the guidelines was to read every single merger decision from the passage of the Clayton Act on. And there's, you know, and I had to write memo upon memo, there's, you know, reams of them in the basement of the Justice Department somewhere of every time a court wrestled with entry or coordinated effects or unilateral effects and how they thought about those issues and how they thought about the guidelines to the extent that guidelines existed at the time and how it played into that. And that was the beginning, right, was the, the folks involved in revising those guidelines wanted to start with what the, what the law looked like, what we had learned over time, in addition to the economics. That was someone else's job. But, um, but I think the, the idea, the decision not to cite you know, not to litter the guidelines with citations was quite intentional because I think the guidelines should proceed from these basic principles, or sound economic reasoning. They ought to reflect something like the truth, right? Um, and there's going to be good decisions and bad decisions, but I think it's awfully defensive and ultimately unpersuasive to ground guidelines in something as quixotic as case law. And what you see is each uh, each citation is ripe for criticism. That sort of advocacy happens ap applying the law to the facts and in the cases, and then you can fight about you know what the right cases are and all of that. But anyway, just wanted to tie those two things together. So j just to add uh, very very briefly, uh, something a citation that was in the draft guidelines and is out now, but still permeates which is it was a citation twice to a line of dicta 
uh, in a case that said the antitrust laws prefer organic growth over acquisition. And, okay, dicta, cited twice. Uh, one Supreme Court justice said it in a concurrence and no one else ever picked it up or, or ran with it. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly some comments were filed pointing out the fact that that was dicta. But another thing that was taken out of the guidelines that had been in for many years is that mergers can be pro-competitive because they uh, result in efficiency. So I think when you look at the guidelines, there is this anti-merger kind of foundation that they're built upon. That is the idea that they don't believe that mergers can be pro or, or generally either neutral or, or pro-competitive, which was a big foundation. We're not talking about the changes to the HSR reporting rules, uh, which is a going to be a huge change if they go into effect as proposed because they are going to burden every reportable merger with this huge almost second request-like requirement to uh, uh, file in huge amounts of information with the agencies. So I think you, you know, kind of have to also keep in mind in English, we would call it the objective correlative, which is the thing that everyone's talking about that no one's naming, which is the basic hostility to, to mergers throughout. And so the citations, the, taking out that citation didn't take out the sentiment, I think. So lots to follow up on uh, here. Um, the idea that presumptions are rebuttable and under what conditions that not uh, unrelated to the question of efficiencies, but I, I wanted to back up for both, maybe starting with both Diana and Bruce on something Diana had said about, you know, there's a lot of economics in the new guidelines. And, you know, in a sense that's true, but at least, you know, for one reader, I wasn't clear what to make of it. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm Colleagues in the FTC's Bureau of Economics and DOJ economists know a lot of the techniques uh, that they use. I mean, maybe it's, it's, there's some value to having some kind of compendium somewhere, but, you know, I saw a lot of things named that could be used, but for me it was hard to understand reading those discussions how and when they would be applied. And I don't know if you have the same view or have thoughts about that and what those economic discussions were for. The, uh, my thought, and this is just my opinion, is that it's economics optional, right? <laughs> um, I, you, you know, I, but I was the bureau director at the FTC, so uh, 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 economics is sometimes optional, right? People never listen to me. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there are parts of it which, you know, they, they have all the tools. And I think that, you know, when, when the tools match up with, you know, their priorities, and, then they'll use them. When they don't, and, that, and that I think that's the big question, which is beyond my pay grade. We have two former commissioners here. I, I, I think, you know, that's the question, right? Are they going to stray beyond sort of the evidence-based approach and just go, go it alone without economics? And, you know, th there are all kinds of risks, but... Uh, you know, I, I think the question of, you know, the final guidelines are better than the draft ones. I, I thought the draft ones were more honest of the aspirational nature of what the FTC and the DOJ wanted to do, and that's fine. Uh, but, uh, you know, how uh, they're going to be used and, and what kind of influence they have, I mean, that's yet to be seen. And I, I think, uh, you know, part of when I was a staff person at both DOJ and the FTC in the, in the 90s, um, you know, it, there was a lot of tension. And when I came back, it was uh, at least on the competition side, not the consumer protection side, but that's another story. But, you know, there, there, there was a lot of ways in which everybody understood that, uh, you know, that they were, you know, producing complementary information. Um, you know, Bruce Hoffman, who was the director of the Bureau of Competition, used to always say this thing about the three-legged stool, and it, uh, you know the economics, the testimonial, and, and evident, uh, documentary evidence. But I, I think that really was sort of an honest evaluation of the importance of having that the economics coincide with with the theory of the the legal case. 
and uh, here, I, it's, it's, I mean, it's a question that uh, how, are, how are the courts going to um, view, you know, when they um, go beyond sort of the bounds of, of what has been done in recent past. And, I, you know, Diana's got win rates, so, you know, maybe they, we have a partial answer, but I think that's a big risk. So just a couple of comments following up on what Bruce said. I, I, I totally, your comment about uh, the draft guidelines being more honest from an inspirational uh, standpoint, I get, I get that. But I also think had, had the draft guidelines been simply um, stamped final without any changes, there would have been a much higher probability that they would be withdrawn in, in the next administration or, or soon. And, we, and that's disruptive. It's very disruptive. I mean, the 2020 vertical guidelines withdrawn. Uh, they hadn't been out for, for more than how many? Two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> withdrawn. All right. So I. 13 months. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I say this because what, who, are the, who do the guidelines speak to? Who are they for? Well, it's to uh, help the business community understand how the agency is going to look at deals. It's to help the public, like me. I wor I've worked in the nonprofit think tank world now for 20 some odd years. Um, I uh, was a former practitioner and a former Fed, so sat at all sides of the table. You know, the guidelines are important. It's they're, they're, they're there for judges. They're there for, they should be uh, transparent. They should, be, they should uh, encourage predictability. They should be administrable. I mean, they're, these are, this is a high, a high, high bar that the guidelines um, must meet. So I think had they stayed in, in draft form, they would have been would have been withdrawn um, fairly quickly. But Dan, I just wanted to touch on your basic question, you know, the role of economics. I think the role of economics in the guidelines is most apparent if you look at how they actually set up the, the um, 11, 10 or 11 guidelines? 11. 11. Yeah, numerically. Num number changing. Number so it's really two groups. Some of you, I'm sure, have already figured this out. It's two groups of guidelines. It's six frameworks guidelines. The only on the only new one of which is the entrenchment of a dominant position. Everything else was discussed in the 2010s, right? Uh, the second group of guidelines are what we call applications guidelines. These are settings, frameworks, con uh, not frameworks, contexts in which the frameworks guidelines could be applied. And there, here's the problem. The framework guidelines are pretty exhaustive, and you know, it's kind of, they're kind of like gospel. Look, highly concentrated mergers, mergers that encourage coordination, mergers that eliminate head-to-head -head competition. We know that near and dear to our, our hearts, uh, certainly mine as a pro-enforcement advocate. The applications guidelines are non-exhaustive. And, and we pointed this out, they are non-exhaustive. They do not include many important contexts or scenarios that could have been included. Um, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I will cede the floor. They do not include many important guidelines. Rather. I'm sorry, many important contexts. Rather, they seem to promote the contexts that are important for the neo brandeisians That's the platform markets, that's the labor markets. Not that these are not important. I acknowledge these are important. It's just that they're, they're non-exhaustive. I worry about judges reading these applications guidelines and saying, huh, well, I get the framework's guidelines, that's gospel. Here are these applications guidelines. This must be gospel too. And so um, I shouldn't be thinking about other applications. So for example, mergers in industries where everybody is vertically integrated, right? Take uh, PBMs and commercial health insurers. You know, everything is a vertically integrated stack. So the competition paradigm is now switching to competition between these vertically integrated systems as opposed to within these vertically integrated systems. Judges, because it didn't make it into the guidelines as an application guideline, judges are not gonna be thinking about that particularly. So our suggestion was don't call them applications guidelines, don't, don't put them in bold font, but include it as a narrative, an illustrative narrative to help the business community courts, um, the public understand how these frameworks guidelines are going to be applied. But I do think those, gui those applications guidelines were a way to insert all of this very detailed economic uh, uh, framework and methodology and analysis. You know, the biggest mega guideline is the vertical guideline. It, it, is, it consists of 10 separate pieces of evidence or information or tests that the agencies will use to evaluate a vertical merger. That's a lot. It, it takes up a page and a half, at least. Um, that's just a lot for, for everyone to digest that kind of information. All I was gonna add is just, you know, on some level the application guidelines are kind of like 
the phrase that I often use with clients is like, these are red flag areas, right? There are things that lawyers can do in their counseling clients in terms of looking at M&A and evaluating it from an antitrust perspective, or we can just sort of, based on what the agencies are saying, based on, you know, what they might be doing in court, we can say, look, this is, you're in a higher risk area. So, right? Like you're doing a pharmaceutical merger, that's a higher risk area. You're a platform doing an acquisition. You have plausible labor issues. Um, there is a sense in which, um, to the extent part of the role of guidelines is to announce where agency policy is. And there are different, thing, different functions that guidelines serve, but I do think that's a fair function for a guideline to serve. Having them lay out where, you know, what the red flags are can be helpful in counseling clients. I'll, I'll sort of say that on behalf of the guidelines. One of the problems arises, Diana, to your point, which is because they're non-exhaustive, what you don't get is as good a sense of, ah, uh, if I'm not in a red flag area, what does that mean for me as a practical matter? Um, and that just makes it harder, I suppose, to counsel. I wanted to follow up. I mean, there are a couple threads here. I started it maybe, but there have been some cheeky remarks about the alacrity with which the 20, uh, 20 vertical uh, merger guidelines were withdrawn. There's, there's um, you know, kind of mentioned you know, vertical integration and in certain businesses. Um, I, I think there was widespread agreement before that vertical mergers could raise. Uh, competition concerns, um, you know, some substantial disagreement about uh, how often, under what conditions, um, but I think there's this, you know, there's the substance question, what did they do? I mean, what was learned either through litigation or uh, study in well, a very short period of time maybe doesn't seem so plausible, but what what were the grounds for that, but also the process. So Bruce, you were there for the 2020 merger guidelines, vertical merger guidelines, which were withdrawn so soon after uh, Lena Khan became chair. Noah, you were actually commissioner straddling um, the two administrations. You know, I'm, I'm wondering just if you could comment a little bit about what you observed about process and you know, adopting the, the guidelines from inside and outside, <laughs> withdrawing or working towards new ones? I mean, how did that work? Um, I mean, my sense was that the process for adopting the vertical merger guidelines, and this is just a sense, was a fairly normal one. I think there was a lot of back and forth between the agencies, there was consultation with the public, there were revisions made. There was clearly a very vigorous discussion among the commissioners at the FTC, unlike DOJ, right? There were five different people, um, and we definitely saw some loud um, disagreements, in particular with the sort of separate treatment of EDM, eliminating double marginalization, really the treatment writ large of efficiencies in the context of vertical mergers. Um, so, but I think it was a fairly thought out process. I remember a lot of discussion, both about the guidelines and the commentary that uh, Bruce noted correctly went along with them, albeit a little bit later. Um, with respect to the rescission, yes, that happened very quickly. Um, and it happened without a replacement. And that was something that at least you know, Commissioner Wilson and I, who, who were both on the commission, griped about. Um, I think part of that was a, you know, desire early on in the new administration to sort of set some terms. You know, we're doing things differently, a signal there. Interestingly, it wasn't the same at the DOJ on that. So there was a little bit of a distinction between the agencies. The second was you had some of the same commissioners who had opposed the adoption in the first instance making that move. So that's not really a surprising thing. Um, I wasn't surprised when Chair Khan joined uh, the Democratic predecessors in her sort of general view of the vertical merger guidelines. Um, you know, my view is that it's good to have out guidelines and it's good to have one message coming consistently from the two agencies. Whether you love or hate a particular set of guidelines, I think at the end of the day, um, you want to kind of know generally what the rules are and hope there isn't too much of an arbitrage between the two agencies. And I think that's, that's sort of important. Um, so just technically, 
I left Christmas Eve 2019. So <laughs> there, but, um, obviously the, the, the drafting went on while I was there. Um, and uh, we talk about a lot of economics in the 2023 merger guidelines. I think the vertical guideline is an area where, and especially the withdrawal of, of the 2020 vertical merger guidelines are an example of the absolute lack of economics. Um, the, the big thing I think that um, uh, Becca and Rohit um, focused on was this, I, I was glad to follow Noah because he said EDM, so I don't have to explain what it is. Uh, but I actually do, because it's, it's one of the unilateral pricing effects in a vertical merger. For a horizontal merger, if you, you know, th th that you have diversion and you capture the diversion and you say, well, if I raise my price, I used to lose that and now I get it back. It's like, you know, money going from my left pocket to my right pocket. And it, it causes upward pricing pressure. Horizontal merger, when you're trying to um, combine substitutes, that uh, is always upward pricing pressure. In a vertical merger, there's a whole bunch of effects. Uh, one is that uh, if you're, let's take the case of input foreclosure, you're, you know, you, you get this diversion-based upward pricing pressure for you to charge your now non-vertically integrated downstream customer for your input a higher price. So, because some of that, some of the guys who, who leave uh, that downstream non-integrated person will go to your now downstream integrated person and sort of like uh, the same type of upward pricing pressure that you see in a horizontal merger. But since, you know, Corno in 1898, we've known that when you combine complements, that creates downward pressure and it internalizes the same type of pricing externality that is inherent in the horizontal unilateral effects. But the pressure is down. And so one of the things that, you know, came out of, of uh, the economic shops was this principle of symmetry. That it, you should do all these pricing effects together because they're all the same. It's not an efficiency. There's no change in the production functions. There's a change in incentives. And in a vertical merger, you, merger, you have opposing um, price pressures. And it, that makes it harder because in a horizontal merger, it's like, okay, if, if the model is, is sensible, then there's this upward pricing pressure and then you go to efficiencies. In a vertical merger, you have things that are opposing and you have to be a lot more careful about how big each one of them are. Uh, and so that's re really why we wanted EDM sort of in the prima facie case. Uh, these guidelines didn't do that because we're, uh, we're not lawyers. So we basically said it makes sense for, to do these things together. What's an example of what we were trying to avoid? And that would be Illumina Grail. I'm not going to get in a fight with Noah. Or maybe I find These things get so boring when there's nobody fighting. But I'm talking about the Fifth Circuit, right? The Fifth Circuit said, well, uh, so Illumina Grail was, you know, Illumina started uh, Grail uh, as a fully owned um, um, sub. And then at some point they decided to spit it off because they thought it would be more efficient to have them do fundraising as a, a standalone. And then they wanted to buy it back. There was the Article 22 jurisdiction in the EU and all that. Let, let's skip it. There was the commission um, vote, which was 5-0, including Noah and Christine. We'll skip that too. Um, <laughs> We'll even skip the ALJ and the commission decisions. We went to the Fifth Circuit and you looked at their treatment of EDM and they said, you know what? It's merger specific, but it's not cognizable because we don't know whether or not the, you know, lowering the price to, to Grail from Illumina will be passed on to consumers. And, and that's exactly, I mean, it's not pass through analysis. There's no change in the cost function, right? The reason they want to lower price is because they make more money, right? And, and so they, they chided Dennis Carlton for not proving enough that, that they'd actually lower prices. And, you know, that, that's just non-economics. And, um, you know, that was one of the big things that, that you know, the, the, all the, the economists who sort of thought about how, how we want to have guidelines 
that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to make sure that all of the unilateral pricing effects were, were done together. It's harder than in a horizontal merger, but that's the, the inherent nature of when you have the, the uh, combination of complements and then you know, the worrying about the raising rivals cost aspect. I think, uh, I, as was suggested, yeah, I mean, economists have accepted that h horizontal mergers uh, where you're now a vertically integrated um, entity and you also sell to independents. I mean, they have, uh, you know, opposing effects. I mean, uh, there's this great article by uh, Hoskin and Taylor. They looked at when Exxon decided, now oh, we're not going to own retail gas stations anymore. What they find both, right? Uh, when they got out, the, the price to their former dealers went up and the price to the independents went down. So if you reverse that in a merger, you know, you, you get RC and you get um, uh, uh, EDM. Um, and so what you do know in that case is that they're not doing this change in de-vertical integrating in, in order to, because of the unilateral price effects. They're probably doing it for the ubiquitous, you know, cozy and transactions cost reasons that people do vertical integration. And, uh, you know, you can put that in, the, in those days. They were put in HMG 10. But um, and this will be the last thing I'll say on this. Uh, HMG 10 and what the, uh, the rebuttal evidence on efficiencies, I mean, I, I don't know if that is that much different than agency practice had been for 20 years. I remember I went to my first party meeting, and it's like, like, what's the efficiency stories? And it was like I, I said I had to put a bomb in the bathroom or something. People just, we're in trouble. But, and, and they were totally unprepared. But, I, you know, on the other hand, uh, you, you can't, I, I mean, I don't think you, you can sort of ignore the fact that mergers, uh, or, or assert that, you know, mergers generally do not create efficiencies. Uh, you're not really thinking about all of the, evidence that out there you know the question of efficiencies came up uh, whether presumptions are rebuttable and under what conditions and you know I think it was a remark uh, you know accurately reading the draft that <laughs> it wasn't clear there was any such thing uh, as a beneficial or even a benign merger um, which among other things left the question what's your basis for attacking some rather than, than others. Um, but, um, you know, they did put, uh, you know, soften the language, but also put some material in about uh, efficiencies and, you know, every, you know, kept saying rebuttable, rebuttable, but, but I don't know, at least me reading it, it what, now, we'll see in the cases, right, how this stuff plays out, how it's used, but, it wasn't clear to me how substantive that was. Uh, so, you know, so some like, oh, one way to rebut a presumption of illegality is, is you know, the failing firm defense. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, everybody knows that. That's a tough row to hoe. Uh, um, and um, I'm assuming they don't want more failing firm defenses uh, or maybe they do because they'll win those cases, but um, it, it was not clear to me how one, I mean, there were a lot of material added about how A, you could rebut a presumption, and then B, here are ways that you can't do it. So, so one question is, um, you know, how useful the introduction of um, both efficiencies and the rebuttal possibility was useful as guidance. And then one thing I've been wondering about is, is this sort of guidance for whom question. It's kind of come up in a couple of these threads because one way to read this, I mean, somebody mentioned a litigation document. I almost, some of this stuff reads like they're walking into court with the Baker Hughes framework, right? Here's our prima facie case. Good luck. Uh, and at least my understanding, I mean, it was mostly in policy, but, you know, I consulted on various 
uh, investigations over the years even got drafted into a little like uh, HSR screening stuff at one point. You know, I always thought that staff in Bureau of Economics and in Bureau of Competition were, weren't screening mergers that way. They were trying to figure out the deal. Not that there weren't any red flags that they'd look for, but, but that that sort of screening process and analysis were very different. Ideally would mesh with what you did in court, but you know, sort of two different documents. Is this making sense as a setup for a question like what, who, <laughs> How well do these guidelines fulfill these various functions? And we can start with the notion of rewriting a presumption or efficiencies, but I'm, I'm thinking internal deliberation versus something else. I, I'm happy to chime in on that, because I, I am of the view and have long been of the view that um, uh, we should be very skeptical about efficiencies defenses in mergers. And, that, and, that, and I have stuff to back that up. Um, we know from the strategic management literature, by the way, the business schools are hugely helpful in, in understanding the motivation and the, uh, you know, the outcomes of M&A. Uh, sadly, antitrust uh, has not fully deployed uh, the business school disciplines, marketing and strategic management, but the strategic management people are all over it. Um, they have, there's documented evidence that most mergers, like north of 70%, fail to produce any um, any revenue synergies. And a, a revenue synergy is not a cost synergy. It's not a short-term cost reduction. It, rather, it is a longer-term uh, consumer benefit from pushing the demand curve out, uh, innovating new products, faster to market, the whole thing. So 70% of mergers are not proving up uh, revenue synergies or longer-term uh, benefits resulting from better coordination, innovation, you, you name it. So number two, we know, especially on verticals, and I won't get into EDM, but hopefully this will be enough pushback for Bruce to make this an exciting discussion that it is 100% um, uh, um, the case that most vertical mergers do not prove up any efficiency. So take AT&T Time Warner. I did a, a study, mini study of AT&T Time Warner. There is no way, no how. I mean, the merger was unwound, unwound three years after it was consummated. Um, uh, th the, the value proposition in that merger was empty right, hooking up content with ISP distribution. It is, it is not a value proposition of any substance at, at all. Uh, the revenue contributions from, uh, um, from AT&T were minuscule. Uh, you know, bottom line, this, this, this merger did not prove up any efficiencies of coordination. The problem is, and this goes to Maureen's earlier comment, we don't really have any, we don't have any good case law on efficiencies, right? How many cases have been, vertical cases have been in court where um, the burden shifted and the defendants came back and then the, the judge had to opine on whether the defendants had refuted the government's uh, evidence of anti-competitive effects. I don't think it's ever happened. So you kind of have to read between the lines before cases get to court where the agent, like suss out what the agencies were thinking. Like for example, I would, I would, I would propose that most of the airline mergers were remedied uh, instead of full out blocked, like we saw in JetBlue Spirit, because the government was probably pretty convinced that there would be some efficiencies coming out of combining networks, right? Uh, we don't know that, I can't prove it, <laughs> but I'm guessing that was the backroom conversation on, on, a lot of these, um, on a lot of these deals. So I think that all of this is to say, I think the guidelines are appropriately skeptical about um, efficiency, but it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be in the guidelines, right? If you have strong rebuttal evidence um, and it's a high bar, to, to Dan's point, you know, merger specific, cognizable, can't result from anti-competitive reductions in output. Those are high bars. But those, are, those bars have been in place for years. They were in the 2010 guidelines. There's nothing new in the 2023 guidelines. Um, if you can get past all those bars, then, then great. Maybe you have a on balance um, efficiency enhancing merger, which, which should be allowed to proceed if, you know, on the merits. But uh, actually, a, a great example is Miller Coors, and, uh, um, and, and Diana will stay well. But uh, they're actually, uh, Nate Miller and, and Matt Weinberg has a terrific article. Uh, it's in Econometrica, where there are more Greek symbols per page than actual words. But uh, Nate, on his website, has sort of a, a friendlier version with, with graphs. Uh, but, it, I mean, that's a case where... I mean, Coors, 
brewed all of its beer in Golden, Colorado. They had a little thing at the, at the Denver ballpark, but it was the biggest brewery in the world, right? And, and then they would ship um, basically big can trucks of water across the country, and they required it, it's not pasteurized, so they required it to be refrigerated, right? And what they did was they distributed the, the, uh, the production of Coors when, when they did the Miller uh, joint venture. And so uh, if you look at um, uh, Nate and Matt's article, I mean, they, they do find, they, they estimate the marginal cost savings. Uh, the the, the uh, thing that I think, uh, I think this was Fiona, but she said, oh yeah, but you know, th their message in that paper is that the, it, it gave, you know, the, the parties t the ability to do coordinated effects and prices went way up, way, way more than the unilateral effects. So, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, you do get efficiencies. AT&T, Time Warner, I mean, they, they, they didn't realize the extent of, of cord cutting and it was, it was a hot mess and people make mistakes all the time. Um, and, and, you know, and, and these are the professional people who do M&A and uh, I'm sure the same is, I mean, in, antitrust enforcement is inherently the same and uh, nobody's ever going to get it completely right. I think the, the thing that economists want to do is, is, you know, they're, they're set out with this task of, of trying to screen between good and bad. And, you know, I think the tools are the way that they evolve to try and deal with that problem. It's not, not, not anything close to perfect. Um, and I think efficiencies, you know, it's really the background, right? You just sort of had this system where, uh, you know, the, the guppy threshold's not zero. Well, it's because the guppy's always positive. So, um, you know, there, there was this sort of built-in efficiencies um, uh, threshold that, that were in sort of the, the enforcement decision. And, and people, I mean, you know, that, that goes to, you know, where you set the, the enforcement line. Uh, and to figure that out, I think you have to do a lot of empirical research. Um, there's this paper out. Um, it's Bhattacharya et al. It's an NBR working paper. And they basically went to um, m and &A database and they tried to find all in retail, all the mergers that had been um, um, consummated in that area. And so they're not having sort of the selection problems that uh, if you looked at John Quoka's work, uh, which is published retrospectives. Uh, they tried to get the whole set. Um, I mean, it, it's it's a neat work. It's very pro enforcement. It's very you know let the if you're going to do a structural presumption, you know probably should not be at 2,500. Um, on the other hand, you know if if you're looking at it, you know you, at the at the you know 2023 merger guidelines. I think the the uh, you know 38 percent of the, those things in between the the 1800 and 2500 would have lowered prices. And so what economists want to do is try and look at sort of those mergers and figure out which ones are which, right? And so, but I, I think, you know, sort of doing the, let's see what happened in a systematic way is a very important thing to do. So I think there is a little bit uh, in this, I don't mean on this panel, but in the wider debate about the uh, efficiencies and mergers, a little bit of a, shell game going on, which is there is this question of for mergers that get challenged and litigated, do the efficiencies outweigh the anti-competitive effects, right? So that's like a tiny, tiny, tiny slice, right, of all the mergers that happen. Uh, and some of the focus on that is used to say mergers don't create efficiencies. Mergers are not worth doing. Mergers are a bad idea, right, across the board. And so focusing on burdening all mergers, right, hence back to the new proposed HSR rules, right. So I, uh, Taylor Owings and I, my colleague, did actually a big survey, because it's very hard to actually measure w whether efficiencies happen from mergers. So we did a big survey of all, all that we could find on this question of whether there are efficiencies from mergers. Because if a merger isn't anti-competitive, um, 
it shouldn't matter whether you have efficiencies or not, but maybe there are still efficiencies happening that, you know, business people, I don't think they would continue to do things if there were actually no, no benefits to it. Um, so our conclusion, and we, uh, you know, people are, are welcome to look at this. This is a, a, a report that actually uh, got published under the U.S. Chamber's um, uh, efforts, so it's available to everyone, uh, was that mergers, um, okay, there's no reason to doubt the one settled wisdom underpinning the basic framework for merger review. Merger review mergers are considered a legitimate means to advance pro-competitive business objectives unless there is evidence that the unilateral coordinated or vertical effects of the merger will cause quality adjusted prices to increase or innovation to decrease. So there is really a fair amount of evidence showing the benefits of mergers and a lot of it is from having assets that weren't as well managed be moved to an organization that can manage those assets better. It's a little hard to measure. Um, but I think there really is robust evidence. So I'm, uh, I get a little concerned because I feel like some of the, the, the statements that have been made much more broadly and um, you know, some quokas kind of statements on these things suggest that, that mergers just don't have any efficiency benefits. Ergo, burdening all mergers is you know, not, not um, going to be a bad thing. So many questions. Just if I could follow up on Diana on, on just two things. One is, I mean, you had mentioned pharmaceutical mergers, which um, is an area. It seems to me that the agencies, especially FTC, have brought in a number of good cases over the years, maybe over 20, 20, 25 years. And you know, I, I would certainly, you know, the idea that pharmaceutical mergers shouldn't be scrutinized seems to me like, well, why would you say that? Um, um, but it also seems to me an area, not that these kinds of deals couldn't raise concerns and maybe even be demonstrably on net harmful or risky, but, um, you know, both for pharmaceutical drugs, simple molecule drugs, especially for biologics, right, recombinant DNA products, uh, and even, say, for class one medical devices where there's sort of more risk involved, we have... We have horizontal mergers, vertical mergers, conglomerate mergers, and there's, there's a history of innovation at relatively small outfits, right, where they may not be very well positioned to bring the product to market. And so, you know, you have novel <laughs> benefits to, I mean, number one, it's an exit strategy. Number two, um, Right, the, the the big player has the deep pockets to spend a billion dollars on the clinical trials, and they have the in-house regulatory expertise. And I mean, to me, these things would all push in favor of deep dives on particular deals. But I wonder how these, you know, there seem to be obvious merger benefits in a lot of these deals. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe they're not net benefits. But how do you put those two threads together? So if we're only talking about pharma mergers, I, I have to recommend um, a study I did a couple of years ago uh, called From Competition to Conspiracy, Evaluating the FTC's Pharma Merger Policy for the last 25 years. And I, it's an interesting question, Dan, and, and it, you know, I think it's a, it's a whole other conversation, but I think pharma is a very, very, um, um, very specific problem. The FTC has never seen a pharma merger that it could not approve subject to a divestiture. Um, even most recently in Am Amgen Horizon, uh, we saw um, a conduct remedy of all types of remedies coming out of the Biden enforcers. Hmm, think about that. But we, um, we, we, we've seen, I, I think it's pretty clear based on the research that the, that the massive wave of consolidation in pharma has really increased concentration in key markets. Um, whether those are efficiency enhancing mergers or not because of of, of uh, R&D issues and cost reductions and coordination between different levels in a, in, a, in a business. I think that's really not the issue. I think the problem with pharma mergers is that uh, the remedies policy is a spectacular failure. Um, you know, even the FTC's own study show that it's, it's divestitures and pharma mergers have failed in like 36% of cases. And so, I mean, that's high. That's a high failure rate. 
So um, we haven't talked about remedies, and I don't think we're going to on this panel, but um, I do think it is a very isolated case of, it, of almost industrial, antitrust as industrial policy, right? Taking very targeted divestitures instead of line of business divestitures, which we know are superior to targeted divestitures. I mean, that's the FTC's problem in its press release today on Kroger Albertsons, right? I mean, these were not line of business divestitures. They were hodgepodge, I think they use that word of, you know, a patchwork of, of, of divestitures. So, uh, on that, and, and, and I think the, you know, my final comment is it would be nice if the merger guidelines were somehow linked up in a, in a guidance capacity with, with remedies, with, with the remedies manuals and the statements, the agency statements on what makes for good remedies. Because the two are very connected with one another. You know, the decision to take a remedy and settle a case versus go to court and, and get an injunction is, it tells you very, very different things about a case. Um. Well, we'll start with Noah, but I want to leave a few minutes for questions from the crowd. I want to let everyone get in a parting shot, so maybe one minute. <laughs> is there uh, is just anything you want to say? Uh, and we, we could start with Noah, and then we'll just come down back this way. I mean, I'm happy to go to questions. I'll just briefly tee off on what Diana said, and I think she's absolutely right. The conversation about remedies is intimately related to the discussion of how you run a merger review program. And I feel like a lot of the action right now, notwithstanding the rhetoric, is in remedies. That's where judges are clearly grappling in cases like United and Asa Abloy with what to do with remedies. Parties are aware that even if the government doesn't want to sign on to the remedies, or at least mostly doesn't want to sign on to the remedies, that that's an option. And it's not covered in the guidelines. I don't know that it needs to, but it is clearly central to the conversation, maybe far more central than the consideration of efficiencies or a lot of the other things that come up in the guidelines. Um, I, I guess I would say one thing that I think, you mentioned, Dan, sort of how these guidelines are gonna be viewed by courts and how courts will use them and how much guidance they give to sort of weighing all of this stuff. One sort of interesting thing that we haven't really talked about is the reorganization of these guidelines to uh, uh, purposefully not start with market definition, right? And um, I think the explanation around that was this isn't intended to be stepwise, and I think the agencies didn't, didn't for many, many years start by defining a market and then go from there. I do think the, the, that shift is positive in that to the extent that perhaps agencies weren't getting confused or but potentially courts were with this idea that market definition was sort of the beginning of the analysis. I think they do a decent job of explaining how this actually works, which is, you know, you start with the frameworks that Diana was talking about before, right? And and the sort of theory of harm and all of these other pieces, whether it's market definition or entry or efficiencies are in service of kind of identifying and evaluating that. I think the flip side of that is that's like the the single improvement in readability that I can identify in terms of the the document itself and to be completely petty about it the numbering system is bonkers and uh, <laughs> and I really wish it were organized and in a way that you could cite it and you could cross-reference it in a way that was logical I feel like that would really improve the lives of all of us practitioners so we are talking about in the merger guidelines a tiny percentage of the mergers that happen uh, and that are reviewed and the FTC's application or DOJ's application is reviewable by courts. The important thing that is happening is that all mergers through these HSR rule changes, the 95% that have to be filed and that never get any, any look at all are going to have a big, big weight put on them I think based on this presumption that mergers themselves are problematic. So we're, we're focused on this little bit that's reviewable and the courts have the final say and what's happening under the surface is something that's not, unless the rules challenge, not reviewable by courts and it's going to have a much bigger impact. Guidance is both to inform the public as to where the agency is likely to take action and to try to influence the courts because they don't have rulemaking authority. So my question comes down to, I mean, it's hard to teach um, young people history, but there seems to be a tremendous stasis uh, 
mindset to this panel that the agency shouldn't get out in front of the courts. And I guess my question is, is the agency just stupid or are you guys just anti-democratic, right? <laughs> <laughs> because you're trying to prevent the agency from doing exactly what it's supposed to. They were elected, and they were told, you know, you've got the authority. <laughs> Sorry, they, they were appointed by people who were elected, and we should expect this every four years, and et cetera, right? Just a few points. So I thought what I heard was consensus, at least of those speaking on this panel, that the guidelines were ready for an update. So I don't think, at least it's certainly not my position, my public position then, this is my private position now, that the guidelines shouldn't be updated. The question is what you do when you update the guidelines, right? And that gets back to your earlier point about like, we have to evaluate what role do we wish this to serve? And there are different roles that guidelines can serve, right? They can be helpful to merging parties in evaluating deals. They can be helpful to courts. Maybe they're also a message to the public, right? That's something we've definitely heard a lot about from the agencies. But then I think it's critical to say, okay, like based on these benchmarks, how are we going to judge them, right? Um, I don't think it is remotely anti-democratic that when government takes on an initiative to think critically about how it's doing that. That seems like sort of essential, frankly, to democracy. I, I think that one of the things that, that uh, you have to think about is that it, it's the administrative agency that a lot of us worked at is really anti-democratic, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I always chafe at the, the notion of neo-Brandeisians. If you go back and you look at Louis Brandeis's career, right, he hated bigness, including the federal government, right? And so they're sort of, I, I don't call them neo-Brandeisians, I call them quasi-Brandeisians, right? Because, I, I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard, if, if they're doing rulemakings, right, I mean, that's, I, I don't know what um, is democratic about, about FTC rulemaking these days. And, you know, there are challenges to it now, but, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see where, where you think it's going to be more democratic to have the FTC do competition rulemaking. Um, my name is Ethan. I'm a student at Scalia Law. I'm also an RA with ICLE. Um, my question is, I know this panel had a lot of critiques for the guidelines, so do you think this is something that, you know, can be worked with over the years and eventually, you know, they write a new one like a long time down the line or should, as some, one of my professors have mentioned, you know, next administration should come and repeal it, write, rewrite it immediately. So I was wondering, like, how do you think uh, the agency should deal with it, I guess, in your view, going down the line? Well, I think that was part of the, that's part of the concern. I think there's a strong chance that they will get repealed by the next administration based on the, the some of the concerns that were expressed here today. I think Diana's right, it got a little bit better from the tra draft to final, but there's still a lot of opposition to a lot of things in there. I think the concern is, I don't think that's good for the long-term health of the, of antitrust enforcement, right? I think the the success that the agencies have had over the years has been aligning, uh, you know, aligning on some uh, some basic principles that don't that aren't so shifting from um, with the political winds. And uh, so I, I think it's a not a feature, <laughs> but a bug if they uh, if they get yanked out um, in a couple of years. So I asked this question in a different event on Friday, so apologies to those of you who've already heard it. Um, and Howard Shalansky gave a very diplomatic answer to my question, so I'm curious how you all respond. But um, to sort of tee off on sort of Noah's comments about how guidelines are supposed to provide guidance, um, I would argue about the enforcement intentions of the agencies given the vagueness of the law. These new guidelines, um, as has been mentioned, have much stronger structural presumptions in them, particularly this 30% um, uh, market share is gonna like, any firm with 30% is gonna get caught up in this, this structural presumption. So to me, that suggests that a lot more deals are gonna get caught by this structural screen. And absent any additional resources for the agencies, how are they going to decide which cases to pursue? Uh, I think one of the things is uh, 
the idea, and they say this expressly, is deterrence across the board, right? They're, they're, they claim, you know, their, their success is deterrence, and they've actually even changed the way the numbers are reported, which if you read the Deckert report, the Dammit report kind of calls them out on this, that deterrence, deterrence, deterrence. So in a way, yeah, they'll pick these deals, they pick the high profile deals and, and things like that, but, but overall, I think it's some of the, the real details don't matter versus kind of a widespread deterrence of mergers broadly. However and artfully, Julie, that was the point I was trying to raise earlier, which is <laughs> the guidelines make fairly clear that a lot more mergers than were yesterday are viewed as illegal by the agency. But they're not going to bring all those cases. And so I think it, it, it will be time more than anything else that will tell us. I think we have in some of the guidelines indications of red flag areas, and maybe that will be a guide to where enforcement goes. But I don't think we know that yet. A yeah. quick comment. I, I, you know, I think you raise a, a really good point. You read the guidelines and you're like, wow, you know, 50 pages and lots of opportunities here for stronger, more aggressive enforcement. But I, I think you have to kind of marry that up with, with the reality of what the Biden enforcers have been up to. And, and again, issuing a study here in a week or so that shows this empirically that, you know, their strategy, the Biden enforcer strategy, is to, in, is to uh, enjoin more mergers. So we've actually seen rates of consents fall off. We've seen rates of uh, second requests fall off. Challenge of rates are down. Um, the, the only rate that's up is the injunction rate. And so injunctions are all about case selection. So it may not be that this new 30% threshold or the higher, the higher HHI threshold for highly concentrated mergers are really going to come into play when we look at the cases that have been litigated and we look at the, at the win-loss record, uh, which right now is right at 50%, and it's lower than the historical average. So, I, I mean, whether, you, whether that's a dose of sort of a, of a political agenda or an ideological slant or bent to the, how the agencies are going about their business, um, that could be it. But I, I'll be, I will be curious to see how that marries up with the new guidelines and how they're, in, how they're applied. Great, thanks. Uh, looking forward to the paper. Um, I wanna thank our panelists. It's a tremendous panel. It was. Um, privilege to moderate and uh, just as it was a privilege to work with and for some of you uh, at the agency. So thank you and thank my audience for, uh, for being here. Thank you.